Hello friends, it's Chris Daniels, aka CD Player Zero here. First, I'd like to thank all of you who have engaged with my content over the last six months. I set out a goal back in June to become monetized within a year. Little did I know I'd reach that in less than half the amount of time that I anticipated. I appreciate every like, share, and comment you all have done. And before I dive into this video, I want to know what's your favorite fingerboard deck company? Let me know in the comment section below. Oh, and don't forget to tap that like button for me. I thank you in advance. All right, guys, so the big topic is here. The history of professional fingerboard decks. And since there's so much that one can cover and do the subject, I basically am limited to focusing it on the early days of fingerboarding. Additionally, if you notice that I'm missing a company, it's probably because I forgot it unintentionally. Fingerboarding decks are arguably the most important part of a fingerboard setup. As I mentioned in the history of fingerboard video part one, prior to 1991, there was a limited amount of options for fingerboarders to use for a fingerboard deck. First, they could use a fingerboard keychain. Second, they could use a skateboard toy. Or third, they could craft their own fingerboard decks. Those that went the latter route would create a fingerboard deck out of anything. It ranged from popsicle sticks, playing cards, old gift cards, pieces of plastic such as CD jewel case, which would be heated up to allow it to be bent into shape, pieces of paper, cardboard, and tape. Yes, that's right. We even made fingerboard decks out of tape back in the day. But it all changed in 1998 when Tech Deck came out. Fingerboarding changed immensely. Tech Decks featured a plastic deck and had graphics for major skateboard brands. It was perfectly timed with a boom in skateboarding as well, and Tech Decks became the latest rage in elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools all over the world. Now, tuning, which includes tape, bushings, hardware, and pivot cups, were probably the first item that fingerboarders began to modify when Tech Decks were released back in 1998. However, next came Dex. Many fingerboarders, such as myself, would modify our Tech Decks by using a lighter to heat up the plastic until the board was bendable. Doing this allowed a fingerboarder to raise and lower the kicks, to increase or decrease the concave. DIYers such as Gary Moyer shared how to make custom fingerboard decks. Here's an example of a composite board made from leftover plastic within the core and two wooden veneer pieces, one on each side. Using a candle, the plastic piece could be bent into shape and the veneer was glued to the plastic using contact cement. Back in 2001, Double Jointed shared with the community a 37-step guide on how to create a wooden fingerboard. It outlines the process of taking a tech deck and making it bare of tape and graphic. Then it would wrap the board in cardboard and use petroleum jelly. This would prevent the epoxy used to create the mold from sticking to the fingerboard deck. After they created both sections of the epoxy mold, one would stack the glued veneers together and use a bench vise or rubber bands to form the deck. After drilling the holes, Double Jointed recommended to use a spray acrylic or nail polish to coat the deck. Does this process sound familiar to anybody? Mike Schneider used this technique in making his first wooden deck back in 2003. One note I want to add is that Double Jointed also innovated the truck game. I forgot to include in my history of pro fingerboarding trucks that Double Jointed sold single axle fingerboard trucks back in 2002. What an innovator and what a contributor in the early days of fingerboarding. Back then we also saw fingerboarders printing off artwork and gluing the piece of paper to the bottom of tech decks. There were fingerboarders such as Remy Gardner who even created their own fingerboard decks. Remy founded Hell's Nails back in 1999. Fingerboards that were made of plexiglass material. These boards were meant to be ridden using pen erasers that were cut in half and taped to the deck as trucks. These boards had immense pop. If you don't believe me, you should check out some of Remy Gardner's footage. Remy is currently working on releasing the next generation of these boards under the brand HN Premium Fingerboards. In terms of the early days of fingerboard graphics, fingerboarders could take a piece of veneer, tape it onto a piece of paper, and print it on directly to the veneer itself. This is very risky as it can damage the printer, 
Early fingerboard decks were inexpensive as well. Typically, deck prices ranged anywhere from $4 to $10. Oh yeah, and I should mention that there was not really a widely adopted online payment system, so people typically sent cash via snail mail. As you can imagine, this meant you had to wait a minimum of multiple weeks and even months before you received the deck that you purchased. Animo decks were out of the United Kingdom and were founded back in 2002 by Ruben Bins. They were very popular at the time in the online English-speaking fingerboard community, and they were one of the earliest brands that I can remember offering wooden fingerboards. Blast were also an immensely popular fingerboard brand back between 2002 and 2004, and were founded by John O'Lee. They were high quality for the time, had nice graphics, and a very large following. Danny Rodriguez, who was a fingerboard legend back then, had a popular online fingerboard store called Good Products Inc. Danny was an innovator and a DIYer and shared all these different tips on how to do DIY stuff, but he also allowed people to purchase products from there. Later on, Danny improved the quality of the decks and created the Ingenuity Deck brand back in 2004. Spo Decks was another early fingerboard company founded back in 2002 and had fingerboarders such as Brandon Jones and Josh Jones on the team. I don't remember the name of the founder of the company. I believe he lived in the area where Brandon and Josh Jones lived. Vegas was a deck company founded by Raymond Rivera. Founded in around 2003, they featured graphics that were heavily influenced by rock and roll and metal music. There was the regular shape and the anti-concave shape. I actually had my first and only pro model with Vegas. And that deck, the one that I used, is currently in Mike Schneider's museum. Another popular deck company back then was Waste, which was founded by Travis Appleman. These boards were great and they had great graphics and were a very high quality product for the time. Mike Schneider joined the fingerboard scene back in 2002. Even at that young age, Mike's curiosity and passion for fingerboarding led him to craft fingerboard decks. He made his first fingerboard in 2003. Later on, he founded Flat Face Fingerboards, specializing in providing high quality wooden fingerboard decks. These decks became a staple and a favorite among fingerboarders from all over the world. Almost 20 years has passed on and Flatface is still pumping out those high quality fingerboard decks. Fingerboarder Justin Clanton had multiple deck companies during this time. One company was called J. Clant Decks and was immensely popular. Martin Ilsley first started selling fingerboard decks under the brand Empire back in 2002. He eventually had multiple fingerboard deck brands which included Athena, Cocaine, Priest, which were these old school shape boards, and Arctic. He was an immensely respected fingerboarder. Other early fingerboard brands in the English speaking online community included Playground Decks, Sunnyside, Regulation Newer Tech, and Supernatural. Over in Europe, fingerboard decks were progressing pretty far ahead of where the English speaking community was. Timo Lieben founded Berlin Wood back in 2001. One of the first professional fingerboard decks, Timo changed fingerboarding forever with his attention to detail. Word got around the world that there were these decks made by a wizard over in Berlin. Back in the old days, there were many shapes. The regular, the deep, the wide, and the wide deep. In the very early days, the only way to get a deck was to know Timo Lieben himself. Later, there was also a secret email address that you could order from if you were privileged to know the email. To get a deck, it cost you around 20 US dollars. And to be honest, back then, most fingerboard decks were under $10. You paid a premium for those decks, but they were well worth it. As I mentioned previously, PayPal was not widely adopted back then, at least within the online community. So you'd be sending cash over the mail. This made it nearly impossible for us North American fingerboarders to get a Berlin Wood deck. Berlin Wood also created longboard shapes. They applied graphics in a high quality manner and even incorporated beautiful engravings. We saw Timo collaborate with other brands as well. To increase the scale and availability of their decks, Berlin Wood crafted their decks in a workshop located in Berlin. One of the collaborators decided to create their own brand using the molds and techniques they developed for Berlin Wood. These were called Wicked Sticks. The community reacted as you would expect. Even though they had the craftsmanship of Berlin Wood, those in the fingerboarding scene who knew what happened boycotted them. This event also led to a significant change to Berlin Wood as a brand 
and sparked a change in the deck making process in general. In 2009, Black River invited Timo to make the decks for Berlin Wood in their headquarters in Schwarzenbach and der Zala. This led to the new mold Berlin Woods, which started with the release of the Elias Asmu for Omar. Elias actually shaped many of those boards himself. With the arrival of pro fingerboard trucks from Black River and Y trucks, we saw 29mm become the new standard in deck size. There was the Berlin Wood New Mold regular shape, which had deeper concave, and a little later on, the Berlin Wood New Mold low shape. Later that year, we also saw the release of the wide and wide low shapes, which were 32 millimeters in width. Short wood and flaked decks were created by Flocky, another legendary fingerboarder. This fingerboard brand also was legendary. These decks were at the pinnacle of quality, along with Berlin Wood. They were known for immense quality of decks, beautiful graphics and engravings, and like Berlin Wood, they had this mythical status for us in the English-speaking online community. When comparing the quality of Berlin Wood, short wood, flake decks, to the boards that we were using at the time, it was like comparing night and day. Finger Fingerboards were founded by three-time world champion and legend Peter Patacek. Based out of the Czech Republic, Peter began to make high-quality pro fingerboards back in 2005. They still are one of the best values in pro fingerboarding decks. You know they must be good when a three-time world champion fingerboarder uses them. Hollywood decks have been handcrafted in Poland since 2005. Back in the day, Mike Schneider used to post tons of videos and photos with him using these decks. He even sold them on the Flatface Fingerboard Distribution website. Peter Ringel founded Preet back in 2006, and the boards quickly became renowned for their performance as well as their beauty. Quickly, it became the most hyped fingerboard deck brand around. And due to its limited supply and immense demand, Preets were sold secondhand for anywhere from three times to five times their original sale price. One time I even saw a Preet sell on eBay for over $400. Peter, ever the craftsman and tinkerer, even experimented with different shapes, materials, and bottom plies. Here's a snowboard shaped deck that Peter Ringel gave me back in 2008. In 2006, Dario Martini founded Hikikomori, which is one of the first pro fingerboard deck manufacturers in Italy. Dario crafted high quality fingerboard decks and even featured manga influenced deck graphics, which was popular at that time. Helter Skelter was founded by Phil Savage and Brandon Beeb. These had extreme concave and were quite larger than the fingerboards at that time. The team included fingerboard legends such as Fabian Afrobi Schreiter, Max Escher Eschenbach, and Joe Leclerc. Evolve Fingerboards is one of the longest running fingerboard deck brands, was also one of the first brands to sponsor people internationally that I can think of. He had writers literally all over the world, including Joe Leclerc out of Luxembourg, Phil Savage from Montreal, Canada, Jim Sabot and Jesus Sanchez out of the US and Ju Radiu out of France. These decks were known for having both steeper kicks and concave in comparison to our modern tastes. However, for a 27 millimeter deck, they performed amazingly well. Primo was founded by Brandon Jones, who was one of the early pioneers in the online English speaking fingerboard scene. Brandon even shared the entire process on how to make a fingerboard deck mode out of Bondo. He also shared the entire process of making a Primo fingerboard deck as well. This was highly influential to future deck makers. No Comply was created by Todd Cuzzard back in 2008. Todd has made as much of an impact on fingerboarding as anyone out there. He created high quality fingerboard decks at affordable prices. He was also a marketing madman and came up with some creative and clever branding and packaging. After a long hiatus, No Comply has been back with a vengeance. Homewood, founded by Justin Rodriguez, was a popular USA fingerboard brand from 2006 until the late 2019. Justin crafted beautiful boards with ply patterns that just really popped. The Homewood I own is one of my favorite decks of all time. Close Up was founded by Damien Bernadette. Damien actually started making fingerboards even before Tech Deck was around. Damien and Tony Potex had a fingerboard brand called FSB that was around at least as early as 1996. Around 2005 or 2006 or so, Close Up released their initial shape. Since then, they have contributed so much to the fingerboard scene. C24 was also known as Chromosome 24, 
was an early innovator in fingerboarding back in 2004 through 2006. Known at the time for making very high quality fingerboard decks, they also had beautiful graphics and were immensely popular. Yellowwood was founded in 2007 by Philippe de Gorgi, just north of Porto, Portugal. Their design and production quality in general helped to take fingerboarding to a whole nother level. Continuously innovating and improving their products, this also applies to their deck making as well. Also out of Portugal, Lopro was founded by Lisbon native André Corral back in 2007 as well. Focus on attention to detail, beautiful graphics, and giving back to the fingerboard scene, Lopro and André have built the fingerboard culture not only in Portugal, but around the world. Gripskin was founded in 1999 by Peter Wolf when his fingers were roughed up after a fingerboard session. This is how the name Gripskin was derived. Initially, it was a local fingerboarding crew that grew over time. Eventually, he created fingerboards after seeing Timo Lieben's Berlin Woods. Using the OG mold method, he would press the boards between two tag decks. Manu Oberla, who made his first board back in 2005, connected with Peter Wolf. Eventually, Manu took over the brand. Until relatively recently, Gripskins were only available at events in person. Gripskin began to utilize a 3D printer to create board shapes and even began to sell 3D printed decks. Fingerboard deck innovation wasn't limited to just Europe and North America. Over in Indonesia, we saw brands like Planktoon and Nut Fingerboards that were founded in 2009. Hooded Fingerboards out of Japan launched on January 1st of 2011. In China, we saw Soldier Bar bring high quality fingerboard decks to the scene. And over in Taiwan, we saw Clark Lin found Karat Fingerboarding. Now, arguably one of the most desired fingerboard decks even to this day is Woob. Woob decks are handcrafted and hand-painted by Zach McLean. Meticulously done, the decks are truly works of art. How these sought after, aftermarket woobs sell for hundreds of dollars. Now, when you see one woob in person, you will realize that the hype is justified. As the number of fingerboard deck companies grew, so did the innovations. Over the years, we have seen brands experiment with carbon fiber plies, innovative shapes, exotic plies, dyed plies, and even split plies. In terms of graphics, the earliest graphics were hand-drawn or painted. Printing on a veneer was a low barrier to entry, as most people at the time had a printer in their house. However, printing onto the veneer itself caused the graphics to be dull and low quality. Another option was to print onto special paper and to glue that paper onto the deck itself and then apply a layer of lacquer or varnish on top. This greatly increased the quality of graphics. As things got even more professional, we saw brands such as Berlinwood, and Yellowwood begin to heat transfer graphics. This increased the quality of decks even more and added another layer of realism. Another thing to look into is the evolution of fingerboard molds. In the earliest times, a fingerboard mold was typically made out of two tack decks with layers of veneer sandwiched between them and glued together. You could use a vice clamp or even some rubber bands and this would help you make a fingerboard deck. Later on, people used to make Bondo molds using the method I mentioned before by Brandon Jones. Well, back in 2008, Nick Barbieri approached me at the rendezvous and gave me two of his decks to try. I reviewed them and found them awesome. Well, Nick and his grandfather, Jim Barbieri, realized there was a market to sell high-quality custom fingerboard molds. These molds were made out of aluminum. They also later on developed 3D printed fingerboard molds as well. This allowed the community to leverage Jim's extensive knowledge of CAD and engineering. For $125 back in 2010, you could buy a custom aluminum fingerboard mold from NFB that also included CAD design, mold, and a shaper template. Other fingerboarders entered into this space over the time as well. Dennis from Fingerboard Molds also offered very high quality custom molds and shapers. Skatemaster231 opened up DIY fingerboards and specializes in crafting 3D printed products, including fingerboard molds. This led to a massive increase in the number of fingerboard deck companies. The barrier of entry was lower than ever before. It drastically increased the overall number of professional decks that are available to the market. Many great fingerboard deck companies leverage the tools that these mold providers provide. Love Drug out of Denmark has been making fingerboard decks since 2011. One innovation they developed was making decks with a Kevlar core. All right, guys, back in 2013, an infamous anime, Brink and Skate Revolution, was released in China. Thanks to this anime, sets of highly unique shaped fingerboard toys were released. Check out this clip of fingerboard legend Bubble Flip, proving that they are superior to a $150 fingerboard setup. 
today we are going to compare the $150 fingerboard and the $1 Chinese fingerboard. So let's start off with the kickflip test. $1 fingerboard. $150 fingerboard. Oh no, I can't do the kickflip on the $150 fingerboard. That must mean that one is shit. Pop decks were founded by Tom. Pop decks were known to have beautiful artwork upon the plies and were also a great fingerboard deck to use. Piratenholz was another board company that had beautiful artwork upon their deck. Just look at how beautiful those bottom plies are with the intricate artwork that's on them. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, it would be hard for me to pack all the history of fingerboard decks into one single video. There's so many companies that deserve to be mentioned here. Uh, many of them I can't find images or videos of and information on. Others I've probably forgot and others have been lost to the annals of time. Stay tuned. In the new year, I promise I will release part two of the history of fingerboard decks in which I will cover 2013 onward and include many of the companies that you're probably wondering why I didn't include in this video. Thank you for watching this video on the history of fingerboarding decks. If you haven't done so already, please leave me a comment in the comment section below on which fingerboard brand makes your favorite fingerboard decks. Also, please mash that like button and be sure to share this video with your social media channels and your friends. As always, I appreciate you all. Until next time, my friends, may your kickflips be as steezy as ever.